Hey everyone. Uh, yep, yeah, my name is Zoom Zoe Zombie Zoe. Uh, so this is about Ruby. It's about metaprogramming and how Ruby works under the hood and a little bit of everything. So hi again. My name is Zoe. Uh, I like sandwiches sometimes. This is me eating a sandwich. This is me at work. Um, I went to Hackbright Academy about three years ago. It's a programming. It's a code school in San Francisco. And they teach through Python. They teach web development over 10 weeks. Uh, and then I started as an intern at New Relic. And I worked there for three months. And then I went, I actually moved from San Francisco to Portland, down to San Francisco, and worked on their business engineering team. Because contrary to popular belief, startups eventually need to make money, or at least make some kind of revenue to say, like, <laughs> hey, keep funding us. Uh, so I built the software to bill our customers. And a few months ago, I moved back up here, because I can't decide where to go. Um, and I started working on a new team doing more site-wide infrastructure. We have a very large Rails app that we kind of are responsible for the care and feeding of. And I'm on that team. It's great, so I get to learn new things. But I've done most of my time in those three years in Ruby and in Rails, and I got interested in what's going on underneath, and I started playing with things, and it was really fun, so I wanted to share it with everyone. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, I was going to go over class inheritance in Ruby, where you're getting your methods from, so method lookup, uh, some of the dynamic methods that Ruby has, not all of them, but some of the interesting ones that I found, and lastly, the singleton class and where that fits into all of this. So. Disclaimer, you're not going to use this information every day. I hope you don't go back to your projects and say, guys, I found out how to like monkey patch this crazy class, and I can do it in a way that nobody else will understand until I explain it, and that's going to be really awesome. No, uh, you've probably heard this, but metaprogramming is dangerous, and it should be used sparingly. Um, this talk is also not about judging Ruby as good or bad. I mainly have experience in Ruby, so I, I'm not contrasting it to other languages. Uh, and so now you might be wondering what the point of being here is, and please don't leave. <laughs> and this brings me to my disclaimer of the disclaimer, which is that you can use this for debugging. Um, you can use this to write better code and understand what's going on. Somebody smart, and I don't know who it was, but they said, <laughs> Uh, when you're writing web apps, you should understand one level below and one level above. And this is that level below under the hood. Uh, and remember when I said like you should use this sparingly and in the right situation? Some people don't use it sparingly, or they used it in the wrong situation. Uh, and you're inevitably, if you're working on a Ruby app, you're going to come across that. And this will give you a leg up in knowing what they're doing. And lastly, as I said, it's fun, and we're going to do some crazy things, and I'm excited. <laughs> so we're going to start off with this class child. We're doing this sim style. So sims start with like, you know, a certain level of intelligence, certain level of creativity. Here, our children are just, just created, so they have an intelligence and creati creativity of one. And when they play, they get add one to each of those, because play is very important for children. And adults, yeah. But these are children, so. <laughs> we don't care about adults. Uh, so when we define this class, it has the method play, but there's a lot of built-in methods that we use on classes and our instances that come from somewhere. So where are those coming from? Uh, if we call child.ancestors, this shows the class hierarchy of the object that we're calling it on. And here, we have child object, kernel, and basic object. And this is basically looking up our levels of superclass. So similarly, if we call child.superclass, we'll see that it inherits from object. And if we call that on the superclass, it inherits from basic object. So we're reflecting this. The difference is that uh, when you call ancestors, it's also including any modules in the class or superclass. So let's go down this chain. We've got object. Object is the default root of all Ruby objects. So basically, if you don't inherit from something else, you're going to inherit from object by default. 
And we see this if we call nil class data ancestors or module.ancestors or class.ancestors. They're all going to inherit from the same chain. Um, so methods on object are available to all classes in the, unless explicitly overridden. And yeah, basically there's some methods on object that all of your classes will inherit when they inherit from object. So we've got allocate, new, and superclass. Um, yeah, and we can do the same with object.instance methods. We see that it has a few methods defined on it that we inherit by default. So next we've got kernel. An object mixes in the kernel module, making the built-in kernel functions globally accessible. All right, so if we inherit from object, object always includes kernel, so we're always going to include all the methods with kernel. So what are those? Oh, <laughs> oh baby, that's a lot. Um, obviously, we're not gonna go through all these because I don't wanna put you through pain, but there's a lot of popular methods included in kernel that you probably use every day. Um, and if we take a look at our ancestors, some are modules, we have kernel in there, and then object, and basic object, and child itself are classes. And we can see this if we call object.ancestors, we'll get this lookup chain of kernel and basic object. So it's inheriting from the superclass object. Whereas if we call kernel.ancestors, it just has itself. Because as a module, it doesn't inherit from anything. It can't inherit, it's not a class. So at this point, I wanna tell you a little story. <laughs> and the story is about Dylan, who is really excited to build his own house. Uh, this is Dylan, he's pretty excited. <laughs> And, you know, he hasn't done this before, but he's like, all right, I'm going to learn, you know, how to do the plumbing, how to do the electricity, how to put up the walls, make this sustainable, it's going to be beautiful. And he starts looking online, he's like, oh man, I just found these amazing, or like, I had this idea for these amazing blue tiles, they're hexagonal, I want them to radi out, radiate out in colors, uh, but I can't find any online. And he's talking to his friend, and his friend's like, oh, maybe you should just make a kiln and then you could fire your own tiles and then you could install them in your house and then you could actually build the house. And he's like, yeah, I think I'm gonna do that. That sounds like the best approach to this. <laughs> so if you identify with Dylan, you probably will appreciate basic object. <laughs> basic object is the highest base class for all Ruby objects and it was introduced in 1.9 uh, to create objects that don't have all of that cruft in object and kernel. So from the Ruby docs, basic object is the parent class of all classes in Ruby, and it's an, an explicit blank class. Uh, so if we check its methods, there's nothing there. If we check its instance methods, we've got nothing either. Um, and this, is, this can be used in projects like RSpec, where you're going to be redefining a lot of methods, um, and you don't want them conflicting with the built-in ones in object and kernel. So to review, if we just create our class dog, we're, in, we're by default going to inherit from object. If we want to explicitly not have any of the methods included in object and kernel, we can do that and have a bare bones class. It won't have dog.new, it won't have anything. So method lookup. Let's make an instance of child. We're gonna play around with it. It's named Zoe because I'm narcissistic. Um, <laughs> so what happens when we call play? We're gonna look up our method chain. Uh, we're gonna look for this instance method on child and we found it, right? Because that's our one method we defined. Well, besides initialize. Um, so what that's called, Ruby will look in child, find that, execute it, and return. Um, if we call 2s, it will look up through child, through object, and then get to kernel, execute 2s, and return. If we redefine that on child, we will find, the one on, find 2s on child, use that, and we'll never get to the method on kernel again, because we've overridden it. So we use this a lot, right? Like, if you define a class human, you inherit a adult and child inherit from human, and they all have a read book method, we're essentially overriding that method so that they can each have a specific behavior. 
And this is a pretty common Ruby uh, pattern of class inheritance. So let's go back to our ancestors chain. What if we include some modules in our class? And basically, uh, we'll be including them from the bottom up when we call method.ancestors. And this is because Ruby runs a depth first, right to left search of its inheritance tree. And I'm not going to go into that, but basically it means that the, the modules that are looked in first are going from the bottom of your class definition to the top. So here we see module B is defined and module A is behind it. So when we call an instance method on Zoe, we're going to look in child, then B, and then A. It's just an important thing to keep in mind when you're ordering any modules that might conflict. Hopefully you're not conflicting. <laughs> um, and we also see this reflected if we actually call child.ancestors, if you don't believe my diagram. <laughs> um, so one other thing we can do is instead of calling include module, we can call prepend module. And this was added in Ruby 2.0. Um, and what this does is it essentially moves that module A in front of the class that you included in itself. So the first place you're, you will look for instance methods is in that module. And B, we have in the spot after child as you would expect. I'm going to take a drink of water now. <laughs> That's so crazy. That's totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the proof. Um, so yeah, <laughs> say if you have a class and you've included a lot of modules and you call a method on your class and you're not sure, you get a, you get a return response that you're not expecting um, and maybe these modules are conflicting. One quick way to tell is you can search for that instance method on your class by call, calling child.instance method and passing it the method name. And this will return uh, this unbound method, which basically means you're not calling this. This is an instance method, but it's not attached to an instance. So we see the class. We see the module that we would find it in. And yeah, sorry. We would see our class, and then we see the module where that method we asked for is defined. So now we can see exactly where we are calling this method from. So we've got our child ancestors. So our full lookup chain, if we included modules in all of these, would be our class, any modules in that class, the superclass, any modules included in that superclass, and so on until we get to object, kernel, and basic object. And this is your full method lookup chain. So let's talk about zombies. <laughs> um, these guys are pretty cute but they still want to eat brains, so I'm a little concerned. They've come to Rubyland, and uh, I'd like to recruit a task force. You're all automatically enlisted. You have no choice. <laughs> We're going to find out how the zombie class is created, how it affects the Ruby class nervous system, and then find a treatment. So the only thing we know for sure right now is the zombies are not created like nice Ruby classes. They're created in weird metaprogrammed ways. This is how a zombie is created. <laughs> so we're using our object class that we saw before. And we're using const set, which is setting a constant on that object class. And a constant is essentially a Ruby variable that begins with an uppercase letter. That's how it's denoted. Uh, so we're passing the string of what we want our constant name to be and the value that we want to make it. And as we see, that returns the correct response. So if we tried this with a lowercase zombie variable, um, it would return an error because it's expecting a constant name, which is, again, starting with an uppercase letter. Uh, we can do the same thing if we set it with all uppercase. Uh, so we have a, a variable here. And then you would think, hey, it's a constant, right? I can't change it. And no. Ruby's like, hey, you already initialized this constant but I will let you change it anyways. <laughs> so now uh, we can change our constant to limbs. So, um, oh, excuse me. Woo. 
So yeah, um, this is creating our class zombie. And this is exactly the same thing as saying, I would like a new instance of class, which is now my class zombie. So zombie equals class new. This is the exact same thing as uh, class zombie, the usual way we define it. Uh, and the brother method to this is object.const get. So you can re request any uh, constant defined on the class you're calling it on. And here, we're passing the symbol of our constant, which is zombie, and it's returned. If it's not in the class, then it will return an error. So zombies have lives, too. Um, <laughs> they really like to eat. They like to go hunting. They like long walks on the beach, or on the road, or anywhere humans are. Um, but the fact is, like, we need more than just the class. They like to do things. So how can we define methods on this zombie class if we aren't opening the class itself. So the way we would normally do this is we have class zombie, we define a class in it, everything's great, this is totally valid, but we're not gonna do that right now. We're gonna imagine that zombie is a third party library that we can't open in this way. Uh, if we were doing this, we could also use define method, which takes two parameters. It'll take the name of the method that you wanna define and then a block with what you want that method to do. But we're not opening the class zombie, mostly because I want to tell a story. Um, <laughs> and so we're not going to do that. But what we can do is we can define a proc with the contents of the method we want to make. And then we will use send on zombie to <laughs> ask it to define a method called eat and pass it our zombie proc. And essentially, we're calling that define method on zombie using send. So if we do this, let's create a new zombie. Hey, she's cool. <laughs> and when we eat, it totally works. So we created a zombie class dynamically, and we've created a method on that class dynamically. So we've got an idea of how zombies work. It looks like uh, they also got into our child class. Um, and this method's here. So when we get bitten by a zombie, there's some horrible changes that go on. Not really sure what's happening. Um, and this is the one part where I, or the second part where I ask you to go with the story and say that there's no way we can, uh, we can't just remove this method from our class. We can do anything around it, but we cannot mess with this method. So. Let's find out what this class does. Or sorry, what this method get bitten by zombie does on our child. So we're gonna create a new child. You know, well, he's average intelligence, that's good. Um, we're not the most ethical of labs here. So we're just gonna push him out there, see what happens. <laughs> and it looks a little painful. Uh, he's kind of in pain, okay. And if we check his intelligence, looks like it's gone down to zero because he has no brains. <laughs> Um, bet you weren't expecting that. Um, <laughs> so now we have a general idea of what this get bitten by zombie method does to a child instance. So if we go back to our uh, method lookup chain to f try and find a cure for this plague. So I showed you this and I said, this is the full method lookup chain for any object. And I lied to you. Um, <laughs> There is one extra part, and that is the singleton class. It's also called the Eigen class, or the shadow class, or the anonymous cl class, or the virtual class, or the meta class, or the object specific class. These are all names for the same thing in Ruby. Uh, I just want to bring them up so that you're aware, but for simplicity's sake, we're going to stick with singleton class. Uh, and one other point I want to make is that the singleton design pattern is something completely separate from the singleton class in Ruby. So uh, don't mix those up. So let's go back to Zoe. And when we call, all, call play on her instance, her intelligence, check that, it increases by one, right? She was at one, we added one more. So let's define a method on her defzoe.play and we're going to increase the intelligence by 10 every time we call this. So if we try this now, check our intelligence, 
12, do it again, 22. It seems to be working. If we check Martin, his intelligence is at 1 because he was at 0. Uh, if we do it again, he's at 2, so he's still increasing by 1. So we've obviously defined this method, but where is it getting defined? So if we revisit our diagram from earlier, when we look up a method, we go through this hierarchy, and we have a singleton class that we've defined this zoe.play specific method right here. So this is the first stop in our method lookup chain in reality, in Ruby reality. Uh, this is an anonymous class that only that is only specific to that instance. So we can check it by looking at zoe.singleton class, and we return this anonymous class. Uh, we can look at Zoe's singleton methods, and we see the play method that we just defined. And we can also double check this. If we look at the singleton class's instance methods, and we're adding in false to say, don't show me any that are defined in my, any of my super classes. If we do that, we have get, receive the same play. So we essentially have this instance that has its own anonymous class where we store any methods that are specific to it. So every object has a singleton class, actually. Uh, methods have them, and classes have them. Singleton classes themselves have singleton classes. So how do they not repeat into infinity? Um, they're actually created lazily. So the minute I ask for zoe.singleton class, or the minute I define a method on Zoe specifically, this will be created. So previously, when we called Zoe.play, it hit the child class, found that play method, and executed. When we define a method on the singleton class, we're now finding that Zoe.play here. And you might not have seen this on an instance like Zoe, but you actually use this all of the time because every object has a singleton class, right? And that includes classes. And we're going to look at that. So if we define our class child, this is the same as calling child equals class dot new. And in this example, child is actually just an object. It's just a new class. So if we call child dot singleton class, we see that it has its own singleton class here. <coughs> It's an object, it has a single in the class. That's how the Ruby works. So we can define a method on child this way, right? And do def self dot run, uh, run away. And this is the same as running child dot run. This looks a lot like def zoe dot run. Um, so if we check on our child class, we see that we've defined that run method on the child singleton class. So really, every time you define a class method, you're actually using that singleton class of your class to store those methods. This is crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, and again, like we did with uh, the instance of child, we can look at the singleton class and look at its instance methods, and we have run. So it's defined there. So because child is just an object and run is specific to child, it is defined on the child singleton class. And this means that what we know as class methods are all defined on the singleton classes of child. The human ones are defined on its singleton class. The object class methods are defined on object singleton class. Uh, so if we call child.run, we find that here. If we call child.new, it's going to be defined on the object singleton. And this looks different from our previous diagram that charts the lookup when we called play. Um, so this is the, actually the diagram that's showing the method lookup for instance methods only for our class instance. Um, so essentially, this diagram is looking at instance methods of our class itself. Um, child, yeah, of our class itself. So what we think of as class methods like child.run is an instance method of the class child itself. And I'm saying class and instance method and object a lot. So uh, I'm just going to give you another way to think about this. 
So essentially, let's go to our instance that we call singleton class. We get a class back. If we get our singleton class as super class, we're going to get child. If we call the super class of that, we're going to get human. And you probably know what's going to happen now. And on up through the chain until we get to basic object. So this is essentially saying if we have an instance, the method lookup is our singleton class of that instance, and then the classes it inherits from. If we do this with the child class, we get our singleton class of child. If we call super class on that, we get the singleton class of human. If we call super class again, we get object. If we call super class again, we get the singleton class of basic object. Water. <laughs> so a class method is really just a method defined on our classes singleton class, right? Um, so we should probably get back to work solving this Solving this crazy thing. We've got a new child named Katie. She's a child. Confirmed. Uh, if we look at her intelligence, she's really pretty smart. It's pretty awesome. And I said we're not ethical, so <laughs> we need to do some more research. We're going to push her out there, see what happens. Bye, Katie. Bye, Katie. <laughs> it was nice. Oh, look. It's just a flesh wound. This is awesome. How smart is she now? Oh, and it stayed there. All right, so if we check her singleton methods, it looks like she has her own get bitten by zombie method. And this must be overriding the get bitten by zombie method that we saw in the child class. So we should probably get back to the lab, show this to our scientists, see if they can create some kind of vaccine with Katie's superhuman singleton class blood. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do that. Hopefully it's going well and they see that guy behind them. Uh, not going so well. <laughs> oh, looks like they've developed something. Some magical science magic. It's an excellent method name. Uh, totally explains what it's doing. So we've got a vaccine. Sweet. So we can vaccinate each child individu individually by adding this magical science magic to the method get bitten by zombie on each instance. And this would override that get bitten by zombie method in our Ruby class. Uh, yeah, so we can see this here if we look at our singleton methods. But this is kind of slow, right? And we're programmers, or I'm a programmer, I'm lazy, I want to do things in a quicker way. So I'm going to use our prepend from earlier. If I define this module with our magical science magic, and then I'm going to prepend it into child. And we have this get bitten by zombie in our class, but that module is going to come first. And we will hit it first when we're looking for this instance method on our child. Um, so if we try this out, we're going to create a new child named Roshni. And if we look up the method get bitten by zombie, we see that it's defined in the zombie vaccine module. That's awesome. That's what we want. She gets bitten. It's just a flesh wound. This is science, people. <laughs> I don't know if you know it. You're welcome. So this is what we have right now. Um, this is awesome. But I don't know if you're like me and you've seen any horror movies, but when they're like, oh, yeah, we injected the sharks with smart serum, but don't worry. We put them in a giant glass tank so nothing is going to go wrong. <laughs> this is kind of like. Oh, yeah, we have this lurking, horrible method. But don't worry, I added a, a module that no one's going to come along in a year and delete because they think it's not needed. Um, this, this, this get bitten by zombie method that we have in our child class is kind of worrying me. So how can we remove this, again, without actually touching it? Luckily, Ruby has a remove method method. So if you call this in your class, you pass it the name of the method you want to remove. Um, this will remove the specific method from the given class it's called in. So now we've got Jonan. He's a new child. Let's see what happens when he gets bitten. Oh, didn't go so well. Sacrificing a lot of children today. I'm sorry. So let's look this up. 
if we look at our instance methods, we want to see where get bitten by zombie is. And we see that it's defined in human. So that remove method took it out of the child, but we didn't actually remove it from our superclass. So it also has a get bitten by zombie method that we're then responding to in the same way. And to confirm, we've got instance methods, and we see get bitten by zombie there. So what we can do is use undef method. And this will prevent any instance of the child class from responding to get bitten by zombie ever at all, no matter what module or class or special fairy dust you sprinkle on it. Um, so if we try this, we call child.instance method to see where it is. It's just like undefined method. I don't respond to that. Um, so yeah, to review, the undef method will prevent your class from responding to that method no matter where it's defined, whereas remove method will just remove it from the class that you specifically called it in. So now, you know, we talked to Roshni. She gets bitten, nothing happens. Zoe gets bitten, nothing happens. Katie, nothing happens. We're like, suck it, zombies. You can't touch us. <laughs> zombies like, oh my god, what's my life purpose now? And then the world goes back to looking at cute cats. Yay. We've successfully dealt with our zombie virus. <laughs> So what do we cover? We've got our ancestor chain, which is looking at where we look for instance methods, if we have an instance. We've got the object, the kernel and basic object, which are built into Ruby. Uh, include versus prepending modules. Const set and const get for setting constants and getting them. Uh, defining a method, the singleton class and singleton methods and how those fit into Ruby. Uh, remove method and undef method. And this is a look at some of Ruby's internals and some metaprogramming there is. There's a lot more out there. There is like, there's a million more things that I wanted to explore and had questions about. And I really encourage you to jump into an IRB uh, console window and just go crazy, test things out. Uh, you can define a class with like basically any name you want. It could be 666 equals class.new. Um, yeah, so I think you'll learn a ton. It's really fun. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>